use of the pill increases the heart attack rate by 50%. And use of both cigarettes and the pill pushes up the rate enormously by 750%. But even so. The report also identifies several risks involving pregnant women who smoke. Perhaps the gravest of these is loss of the baby in late pregnancy and at birth. There is a well-established probable cause and effect association between cigarette smoking and rates of late fetal and infant mortality. The weight of the baby is also connected. The report says more than 30,000 babies are born each year in the U.S. with lower birth weight because their mothers smoked during pregnancy. Smoking, says the study, is more than a nuisance to some people who do not smoke. It can be a significant hazard for those with chest pains caused by heart disease. Tobacco Institute reacted quickly, calling the HEW report a classic of bias. I think the report is deceptive and also misguiding. And it certainly is very unfair and also very cruel of Mr. Califano to blame all the ills of females in our society and problems during, encountered during pregnancy on tobacco. The Trade Association claims the HEW report ignores scientific criticism of the major studies on which it is based. Jed Duval, CBS News, Washington. It's uh, hard to believe that in the field of cancer prevention, cancer treatment, not everyone is always on our side. And uh, I never cease to be amazed in particular when we consider the subject of cigarette smoking at how this issue has been turned around as if it's an issue for adults only, where kids are so seldom considered when it comes to the issues of tobacco advertising or tobacco use in general. In fact, this is the only health issue I know that is addressed at this health conference where there is an active opposition to prevent anything to do with this issue really becoming effective. So with that in mind, I have to warn people that my talks tend to be hazardous to their preconceptions about how we deal with an issue that is killing more Americans than all cases of tuberculosis, AIDS, pneumonia, automobile accidents, suicide and homicide combined in this country every year, year in and year out. It's so common and yet so utterly preventable that it is passed into the realm of the ordinary. So the biggest single enemy and the obstacle that we face is complacency. And the very major purpose of the tobacco industry, for that is the enemy. It's not smoking. It's not <coughs> cancer. But the very origin of the tobacco issue, which is the tobacco industry, their single goal is to foster complacency, especially among those of us who don't use their products, so that we will believe that this is just another issue for doctors to deal with in their offices. They hand out pamphlets or posters. And with that in mind, my research assistant, Jim Smith, is handing out our own bit of pamphlets. What this is, is a packet that he and I passed out recently in the city of Houston at what is known as the Ebony Fashion Fair. This is really a promotion with the transparent name of Ebony, which is the magazine of Johnson Publishing, which is in effect sponsored by the R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Company. And it was taking place in a public tax-supported hall, the very place where the Baylor College of Medicine had its commencement and where Surgeon General Coop gave the commencement oration. More than a 1,000 black Houstonians gathered to watch the Moore Ebony Fashion Fair, where within the actual fashion fair itself, cigarettes were promoted right throughout the actual modeling of the gowns. More than a 1,000 people paid $20 a piece in a very highly fashionable occasion to be the beneficiaries of tobacco advertising. We have about 50 people left at a conference that matters more, as far as I can see, than any conference I have been to 
in the last two years since the last realities of cancer minority communities that Dr. Lovell Jones created. And it's almost an inverse ratio, as we well know, that minority health issues get the least attention, the least time, the least funding. I think the problem may be also with us, because many of us are locked into cognitive educational approaches. We've got to give people the facts. We believe that people act on facts, and they change behaviors. I'm afraid that that's not where it's at. We have other objectives in teaching besides cognitive objectives. We have attitudinal objectives, which I believe are far more potent motivators than facts. Attitudes, also behaviors. That's obviously our ultimate aim, to get people to change their behavior, but we're still locked into those health behaviors because we've got to do research studies, we've got to get published, we've got to get promoted. And really, a lot of what we do is in our own self-interest. And yet, there's not a person here whose job depends on there being a decline in tobacco use in this country. In fact, if you stop and think about it, the more tobacco use, the more need for healthcare professionals, the more we'll have a nice, steady lifespan of studying this horrible problem. I think the government has failed in this issue. An abysmal failure, in spite of the marvelous work of the Office on Smoking and Health, it's a joke. We talk about public service campaigns. <coughs> Those are the ads, you know how public service ads are defined. Those are the ads that are on at 3 o'clock in the morning telling kids to not to take rides with strangers, when the only people, of course, up that time of night listening are the strangers. We're really not getting to people, because we have failed, and not just government. I think the American Cancer Society has failed. I support them. There's not a soul here that doesn't but we fail to get into the context of where people are. Not to come to get pamphlets from us, but in the day-to-day -day context of their community. I love many people within the Cancer Society. I hope that we can take things as constructive criticism. Heck knows they give a lot to me. But the important thing is to look at the origins of that organization, of our own government health efforts in cancer control. It's come about because we have failed to communicate how it is that people understand. And in our society, for better or worse, it's through images. Images that count. Images that are symbols for what people count on. Images that move people. Images that react, that they react to. And we have failed to grasp those images. I'm going to talk about semiotics, or the study of symbols or images. And I'm going to go through a little bit of a history of the way in which the tobacco industry operates in this country. I'm going to talk about different ethnic groups, but with a focus primarily on black Americans and Hispanic Americans, the two most hard hit by the tobacco industry. And I think we've got to get used to this kind of linguistic revocabularization, because that's my objective today. To get you to look beyond simple words, smoking causes lung cancer, or to give the facts and figures about how many people are dying, but to talk about the leading preventable causes of death in our society, which is number one, Marlboro, followed by Winston, followed by Cool and Salem and so forth. And the causers of death are Philip Morris and RJR Nabisco and so forth. These are the kinds of words that we should be talking in health language, in government circles. We should not be afraid to understand who is causing death. This is not like not getting pap smears. This is not like not getting mammograms. There's no one out there taking billboards out there saying, hey, whatever you do, don't go down there and get a mammogram. There are people standing outside our very clinics. There's one barely a mile from here literally outside a little emergence center saying, enjoy, enjoy, from Merit Cigarettes. Have taste, we'll travel, making a mockery, in effect, of everything we do. So the formula that I'm going to use is not just fear, is not just anger, but humor. And I think that laughing these drug pushers out of town, getting to know them as parasites, is what it's going to take to have people stand up and say what's really going on, and not to talk about issues like smoking and drinking, in generic terms about alcohol consumption and tobacco consumption and smoking and pack year histories and all that nonsense and to shift the vocabulary away from smoking cessation of people in their fifth and sixth decades who are going to stop anyway one way or the other and on to the first and second decades and primarily that second decade the 10 to 20 year olds that's when kids start smoking not 0 to 10 not 20 to 30 but 10 to 20. That's the age of onset. If we took juvenile onset cigarette abuse, as we do juvenile rheumatoid arthritis or juvenile onset uh, 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 diabetes mellitus, 
we might at last frame within our funding circles ways to go about this problem. But the tobacco disease is being actively opposed. And I think that the comments I'm making really are, are I hope, optimistic. I know they're hard hitting. But 20 years ago, Martin Luther King was reviled when he spoke against our involvement in the Vietnam War. Time Magazine condemned him as a traitor. Newsweek, The Washington Post. The kind of prescience that he showed, not only talking about the involvement of black Americans in the Vietnam War, but our very nation's culpability and involvement in this horrible fiasco, only proved within time his correctness on that issue. And he took a lot of heat and he withstood it. And you know, with the FBI and so forth. We're dealing with that issue today where even in a medical school in this country, you cannot speak out directly against a tobacco company. You can talk all you want to your blue in the face about carboxyhemoglobin levels uh, in the left toenail, and you could even get a grant from R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Company to do that. But if you dare speak the origin, if you dare study this disease like a parasite that it is, and you study their annual reports, and you understand that the origin of the tobacco problem is the tobacco industry itself, people go away from you like a, a bacterium in a petri dish full of penicillin. So I, I hope that at least the revocabularization re process will take hold today. And the failed context of where we are will become apparent in these slides. And I did warn you that the talk was going to be a little hazardous. And this very first slide, you might not want to look at. Because it's so gruesome and so awful and so disgusting and sickening that many people simply turn away. And there it is. 390,000 deaths attributable to cigarette smoking. That from the Office on Smoking and Health. 106,000 in 1985 alone dying preventably due to tobacco-caused disease, lung cancer. I've asked pulmonary specialists, have you ever seen a case of lung cancer in a non-smoking individual? And every one of them has always said, oh, yes. And I said, well, gee, could you have the record? I, no, I just don't remember exactly when that was. The point is, we all know it can occur. And lately, with the work of Jim Rapace at the Environmental Protection Agency and other researchers like Hirayama in Japan, maybe those who didn't smoke are indeed turning out to be the spouses of those who did. So maybe lung cancer as a disease, that is squamous cell or adenocarcinoma of the lung or oat cell, does not exist in someone who does not smoke. But the real killer is, of course, heart disease. Stroke, chronic lung disease, other cancers, and other diagnoses. Perhaps the most conservative estimate from our own government, 390,000 deaths a year. Well, there he is, typical healthy heart expert a Native American who we used to put in advertising for Prevention Magazine because there's a guy that knew his heart, ate a lot of fish, a lot of fish oil. And that same individual and his wife from his own area of the, of the country are used in advertising for another source, National Geographic, to promote what? Perhaps it's to promote the fact that in her left hand is now a cigarette something that even the furthest reaches before satellite TV happened to arrive in her hand. Because the tobacco industry is very good and very clever at creating itself within the context of local communities. That's their whole lifeblood. And if that healthy couple can now become hooked just like the rest of us, where else on earth are they going to be? Maybe they'll get to the baby seals. And my feeling is, that if we woke up one day and we actually saw a headline that said that uh, baby seals were dying of lung cancer, then we'd finally really do something about this. Then it would really matter to us. But black Americans and Hispanic Americans and Native Americans, killing them, forget it. We're talking about prevalence. And don't you dare get out of this conference or any governmental conference or any statistician or anyone in this CDC area saying that we're licking the problem of smoking. Dr. Taylor was eloquent in the area of pap smears and others, but I'll tell you, I don't think too many people from his neck of the woods are going to want to come and face an audience and talk about where we're going on smoking and where we're going on lung cancer in this country. When the National Cancer Institute issued its report, its anniversary report, it figured out a way to do a bar graph that wouldn't really quite show what lung cancer was up to. 
because the survival rate of lung cancer has not changed in 30 years. We're not going anywhere on this issue. In fact, I believe we're worsening on it. Sure, I understand that there might be a 1 to 2% dip in the average smoking consumption over the past few years on average. But that may not relate to the fact that that's doing anything because of those who continue to smoke, their numbers are increasing, the numbers of cigarettes they're smoking. We talk about prevalence going down. That may be true in upper income groups. But when we talk about black Americans, when we talk about Hispanic Americans, when we talk about some Asian American communities, when we talk about Native American communities, not all, but some, we're talking about prevalence of 80, 90 percent. We talk about teenagers going down. Sure, we know that from the high school senior surveys. High school senior surveys, the kids that are going to go on to college say that they're not smoking as much. But what about the dropouts? What about the kids that we've given up on? Where are they being surveyed? I'll tell you who's not giving up on them, the tobacco industry. They love them. Even if you go to New Mexico and you go to the Indian Cultural Center, you want to go to see their museum and the Indian culture, the restaurant, the galleries, the theater, that's where they have cigarettes as well. It's everywhere. And Native Americans are also playing a role in their own demise through the continued sale of tax-free cigarettes on the reservations. Talk about a Native American tragedy. That's one. On the other hand, maybe, as I said, they're getting even with us. But that's the problem, where we don't even have enough guts to try our very best to come up with some alternate funding other than selling debt. The key role of the tobacco industry in the 1990s will be to market toward ethnic consumers. We know this because the tobacco companies tell us this ourselves. We don't know this from medical textbooks. We know this from marketing textbooks. The marketers are very proud of what they do. Of course, the tobacco companies don't exactly say that they're tobacco companies anymore. They've taken the word tobacco out of all their names. But the fact is, that's where the golden core of profit comes from. Marlboro Hispanic Magazine, the premier issue. 50% of the advertising for one brand of cigarettes. Anywhere you look. And it's a marvelous campaign for Winston, America's best. Could you see this? You know, the immigrant that wants to fit in? You know, America's best. And you see the, the guy who uh, doesn't like him, who doesn't want him to fit in, saying, I'm an American. So he gets, they, they get everybody. It's truly amazing. We talk about smoking going down. I challenge you to go with me to the Winston drag racing. 40,000 strong, where the announcer says, and be sure, before you leave here, make sure you get yourself a couple of nice packs of Winston cigarettes and smoke them on the way home. I mean, I, I even purchased uh, earlier this week in Colorado a six-pack, which is now how cigarettes are going to be marketed. And as I got off the airport in Colorado Springs, this is what I saw. I, well, I brought it with you just so you could see it. And uh, just how a smooth move. How they're talking about making the moves on girls and so forth. Three packs, get three free. But it's a six pack. They borrowed this from beer, and now they're doing it with cigarettes. Another one at the stands was Cool and Mild, Cool being the leading brand of black Americans. What is menthol? Menthol is an anesthetic. But you ask someone, name me the color of menthol. Everybody says it. It's green. It's not green at all. But that's how we're imprinted through symbols. 80% of black Americans who smoke, smoke menthol cigarettes. If you look at advertisements and magazines such as uh, Essence, they're only, only the menthol brands that are advertised. And uh, only Virginia Slim's menthol, only more menthol are advertised. It's truly amazing that we've really cordoned off the black population into menthol brands. Menthol is an anesthetic that deadens the throat, you believe it's cooler, and you smoke more. It's an easier way to go. It's a much easier way to die. It's everywhere. In Puerto Rico, Winston corners 80 percent of the tobacco market by associating itself with Puerto Rico traditions itself. Not many people realize that if we were genuinely to target the Hispanic population and the tobacco issue, which I'm maintaining we're not now doing, apart from a small project here in Texas, as far as I know, we're not even going into the Hispanic community around the country on tobacco. Oh, we may well have some pamphlets translated into Spanish, but I've never seen the tobacco industry take out an ad saying, send for this free pamphlet. They know exactly how to get kids, and they get them right where the kids are. Los Angeles, New York, Miami, San Antonio, and so forth, several of those cities right here in Texas, Houston, number six. If we simply mobilized all of our counter-tobacco efforts on, on, on those 10 cities, we would hit 70% of the Hispanic population in this country. 
Instead, we just don't think like that because we don't think in terms of a map. In health, we think in terms of statistics and the Sears study and numbers and prevalence and incidence. And we recycle them and we update them and we just don't do much about them when it comes to cigarette smoking. Because we don't have a map when it comes to doing something about it. We put it up for a competitive bid. We don't have a calendar to see where the Hispanic holidays are and where we should be. And we don't even have a comic book that kids are buying. Comic books with Pele, the soccer hero for the Pele Tang soccer team. And when you turn on TV, you see the Marlboro soccer team owned by the same company that makes Tang, using one of the company's products to get it to another. That's what we're looking about when we're talking about smoking. We're talking about emphysema and emphysematous bleb. But you've never seen that on a billboard. There's never been a TV special. I've never seen anyone on television, which is the leading medium for Hispanic and black Americans, ever die of a tobacco-related disease. Lucille Ball right now is dying. But do you think that they'll relate that to the fact that she sounds like a frog and she's been smoking for 30, 40 years? That's not the way they do it. We've got to be respectful for people who are sick. We can't possibly offend them or offend anybody else by daring in this time of dire consequence to relate that to the fact that she was a victim of tobacco industry products. We say, well, she chose to do that. And the people in the ads that she was in for Philip Morris chose to smoke Philip Morris, perhaps because she was in the ads. Her husband died of lung cancer. She's dying of heart disease. And we talk about not wanting to have anything to do to connect the dots, connecting the product, Philip Morris, with death. And that's what we look at in the autopsy table. That's what we see in our clinics or in the operating room. But we don't ever want to whisper that outside of our own clinic. There's the problem, the American tobacco companies. Well, that's not exactly the problem. It, it, this is perhaps a bit more accurate. That's the problem. Cancer's seven warning signals. Number one, Philip Morris, makers of Marlboro, Benson and Hedges, Merritt, Virginia Slims, Miller Beer, General Foods Products, Bill Cosby for Jell-O, Post Cereals, Lena Horne for, for Post Cereals, RGR Nabisco, Nabisco cookies, Oreo cookies, Winston cigarettes, Salem cigarettes, more cigarettes, the more fashion show. Lowe's, Lorillard, the makers of True, Kent, and Newport. Newport, one of the three top brands in the black community. The president of Lowe's just endowed a hospital, Tisch Hospital in New York. Now it can get them coming and going. The important thing is it pays to advertise. Brown and Williamson, British American Tobacco, Cool Cigarettes, American Brands, Lucky's, Carlton, Carlton is Lowe's, but Doc, I smoke low tar. That's like saying, you know, I, I smoke low poison. Tar is poison. It means over 35 separate cancer causers. We still have, correct me if I'm wrong, recommendations to switch to a low tar cigarette, even from such august buddies as, as the American Cancer Society. Of course they say there's no safe cigarette, but if you smoke, switch to the lowest tar. That's theoretical nonsense. It's been nonsense since the National Cancer Institute in the 1970s devoted its entire smoking budget to develop a safer cigarette. It's nonsense today when we talk that there is in any way, shape, or form safety in smoking a lower brand. It's safer than what? Than fresh air? The important thing is that low tar means low poison. And you wouldn't tell a friend of yours to, now, I wouldn't want you to jump off the roof of this building where we are right now. I'd only want you to jump off like, well, like the fifth story. That's what you're doing when you're saying, I want you to switch to a low tar cigarette. Look at Myers, makers of generic cigarettes. And I've had patients say, oh, no, no, I don't. I save money. I don't buy the $12.99 carton. I buy the $7.99 a carton. U.S. Tobacco Company, makers of Skull Bandits, the really up-and-coming young cancer. And there we are. That's from the quarterly report last year from Philip Morris. There is our typical consumer buying his Oscar Mayer products, his Miller beer at the 7-Eleven, and, of course, picking up a couple of cartons of Marlboro. Now, with the Marlboro, he's paying cash. Because food stamps, you know, that just goes, yeah, you get bread for that, but good cold cash, that's lottery tickets in Marlboro. And there is a store in Brooklyn, New York, where you can actually cash in your, 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 your welfare check and get lottery tickets directly without ever seeing the cash. We're talking about a society that exploits the least educated. We all know that. But we're talking about a corporation on the Dow Jones average, one of the top 10 Fortune 500 companies in this country making a killing off black Americans. 
What's their secret? In my opinion, it's ubiquity, propinquity, iniquity. Ubiquity? Well, they're everywhere. They're outside a child's window as he wakes up in the morning, looking out into the sunshine. They're everywhere. In every store, even a pharmacy that talks about a carton of milk and a blood pressure test and a, gives you a discount on cigarettes. Propinquity. They're over at the summit, where we watch the Rockets play basketball, in Chicago, where we watch the Bulls. And they're in Shea Stadium, New York, or Oakland Coliseum at the All-Star Game, where Dwight Gooden was introduced with the New York Mets. Or they're in Jet Magazine, which during Black History Month this past February featured Dr. Martin Luther King giving a message of inspiration brought to you by Philip Morris Companies. Killers of 130,000 Americans each year. Of course, it's got to be a little bit sinful, iniquity. And there it is. It's not quite a cigarette, it's a fashion fair. Targeting markets is the mastery of the tobacco industry. British American Tobacco makes cool, targeted almost strictly to black Americans, although they are also targeting that to Hispanic Americans. Notice that the last one is very interesting on, on Philip Morris, uh, that Marlboro is not targeted in the black community, except in the menthol brand. And my theory is, if you ever saw a black Marlboro man, sales of Marlboro among white Americans would plummet. We're dealing with a racist company, which is traditionally voted in Black Enterprise Magazine, one of the top 10 companies to work for. Hell, it's very hard to get Harvard Business School graduates coming out of Harvard to work for Philip Morris. You doggone right, they're gonna go for some of the black college graduates to gar start working for Philip Morris. It's a cynical attitude I take to it, but it's absolutely true. Through Essence Magazine, through Jet Magazine, through Ebony Magazine, the reach of black magazines is enormous, and the tobacco industry are there. 47% of women see ebony each week, 38% uh, each month, 38% of men. Jet, 37% each week, 40% of men, and so forth. And Sports Illustrated is a very popular magazine among black men, as you'll see in a bit. But it's not just the magazines itself, it's not just to us that they're aiming at. It's the journalists themselves. By featuring black journalists such as publisher Maynard of the Oakland Tribune, doing his portrait. Well, that's another of their companies, the Miller Brewing Company showing how concerned they are for the role models of black communities. And they ushered in 92 black publishers to the Philip Morris headquarters right after the AMA came out with its proposal to ban tobacco advertising. They came out to condemn efforts to ban tobacco ads, saying this is a freedoms issue. And we have, of course, the Tobacco Institute, which I call sort of like the Goebbels Institute or the, uh, um, you know, the Propaganda Institute for for genetic relation, you know, whatever it is, the fact is, if there was the Asbestos Institute, you wouldn't uh, even believe this. This is nonsense. But there's no mystery why they take a young black woman, because that's the major target market. But she's there, after all, to tell you both sides of the story. Oh, the, the side on the left, perhaps, or the side on the right. Well, at least that's the sides we're trying to talk about. But we're not getting the message across, because we're not up on the billboards alongside the drug pushers. They're there in Congress talking about debates. The smoking and health controversy, the low tar and safer cigarettes, the smoking public versus those anti-smokers. The neo-prohibitionists, those First Amendment protectionists, and of course those anti-smokers, those segregationists that want to pass these laws, and those people in the tobacco industry who are so caring about black Americans. There they are in Houston, Texas, at the National Urban League annual meeting, giving out all the free samples you want. In fact, it's a veritable display of cigarettes. As soon as you walk into the floor of the National Urban League Annual Meetings, or the NAACP, or the United Negro College Fund, you think you're walking in Tobaccoville, USA. Every tobacco company has the best floor space. They are up there. You might as well be a, you know, back at home reading a book if you're running one of these organizations because you won't have any say in how these organizations are run once the tobacco companies hit town. Outdoor advertising reaches ethnic groups better than any other medium aimed at ethnic groups, says Gannett, publishers of USA Today and over 90 other newspapers in this country. It's not just the tobacco industry. In fact, in my opinion, far worse than the tobacco industry are the media corporations. We know right from wrong. The tobacco industry certainly does too, but you sort of expect it from them because they're fairly evil people. They might even be insane like the Nazis were, but the fact is we're willing to understand how they operate. But is there any excuse 
for a newspaper, black-owned or non-black-owned, to sell out its own readers by saying, well, in a free society, we ought to advertise as we choose. Look at these figures, purposely garbled in a very hazy slide, so that you might not fully understand the impact until you see the next slide of what the numbers really represent. But in black communities and Hispanic communities, we're talking about 50% of the advertising dollars going into tobacco ads. Combine it with alcohol ads, and we're talking about upwards of 90% of that money in many neighborhoods for tobacco and alcohol. In St. Louis, where the best figures have been done and the best surveys have been made, we're talking about five times as many tobacco and alcohol billboards in black areas as in predominantly non-black areas. And they say they're not going after blacks. It's, it's really amazing. And what is their defense, by the way, when we talk about how it's marring the landscape, how it's destroying what kids are growing up believing? This is their response, that it affects jobs. Nobody can figure out how they can possibly come up with that many jobs. There aren't even that many employees of the billboard industry in the entire United States. But we figured that they are using a national figure of those dopes that go up and, and, and put up the signs. There are about 100 or 200 in this city that do that. And of course, they protect the freedom of speech for social and political messages, none of which, unfortunately, we in the anti-smoking movement have been able to get up on their billboards, but which the other side has been able to get up in ample quantity at great discount prices, such as this, not very far from, from the MD Anderson Tumor Institute. And even social philanthropy, the Cool Achiever Awards, every summer on the 4th of July, saluting those black Americans who have made a difference in their communities. The Cool Cigarette Achiever Awards. It's called, in a kind of a way, a phrase borrowed from the Colombian drug lords, narco-philanthropy. You know, in Colombia, they give gymnasiums and tennis courts to help the poor villagers. And they're beloved in many communities now, I'm told, in Colombia. These marvelous drug lords that are coming with their $35 billion cocaine deal in this country and killing off Americans so that they can go back home and buy gymnasiums and tennis courts for their villagers. Is it any different in this country when Monday's Virginia Slims comes to town in this community featuring a young black American who's going to be the next teenage superstar of tennis? It's truly amazing. A carton of cigarettes for 7-Eleven, thank heaven, and be sure to help us fight sickle cell disease. The very same company. Because sickle cell is a symbol. That's the semiotics I alluded to. I could be the worst character in the world, but as long as I say I want to help you fight sickle cell disease, I will get a hug. The numbers affected by sickle cell disease in this country, number one, are being well diagnosed, and number two, being better and better treated but we are not doing nearly as well with tobacco-related onset and tobacco-related diseases. Kids who sell crack, says the predominantly white-owned Time magazine, the leading communicator of news information on a weekly basis in this country. Kids who sell crack, you know who they're talking about. The kids in the inner city, those ghetto kids that are selling us crack. And of course, let's just calm down for just a second, take a look at the back cover, and begin to get the perspective of what this magazine never in its history has ever alluded to as anything other than just another Surgeon General's warning, which we all know we've heard since the age of two anyway. And we have a right to choose what we want to do. Of course, they'll help you along. And how do I know that? Because this ad says where there's smoke, there's a hot market for cigarette advertisers in Time Magazine. Ask seasoned tobacco manufacturers how's business, and they're likely to tell you more challenging than ever. That's because we're making some headway. But the good news, according to that ad, for Time Magazine in a tobacco trade publication is that tobacco sales are rising among women, 25 to 49 year olds and high school graduates. So be sure to take your tobacco ad out in Time Magazine to reach those 20 million readers each week. And there's Sports Illustrated with Earl Campbell on the cover and the cigarette ad on the back cover. Boys are not reading Boys Life. This is what they're reading, the leading magazine among 12 to 14 year old boys. And there's Flo Joyner, or at least her look-alike, right after she won an Olympic gold medal the very next month for the Marlboro Sports Calendar in Sports Illustrated, which in 35 years has never once touched on tobacco as among the leading causes of athlete prevention. And there he is, Earl Campbell again, just a pinch, something for nothing, a pinch is all it takes. Earl Campbell, a hero in the city of Houston to every young black kid, pushing dope. 
And there it is, those same kids, 15, 20, not even that long, because it didn't take young Sean Marcy more than eight years to develop that and to die. And there was even an individual on the faculty of MD Anderson Hospital that testified in behalf of the tobacco industry, saying, we just don't know what caused it. It could have been something else, maybe his genes. It's truly astounding. Doc was founded to engender ridicule, to begin to laugh the drug pushers out of town. And it's not easy, as you can tell. You get so angry, you get so wasted by what has happened in this community, in every community, by the fact that we talk about health, and we talk about civic responsibility, and we talk about literacy, and all the things that matter so much. And then the Philip Morris Company comes along and gives a leading health campaigner its award to give to the literacy volunteers. It's truly astounding how they even co-opt the most ardent opponent of tobacco. We're fighting for your life, says the American Heart Association. They even paint the heart red. And what does the tobacco companies do? They don't get angry at that. They know that it's just a public service ad, so they come along and say, we offer you more, because they know how to buy their space and get it in front of the public. We want it to be up on billboards, too, with mountains and fresh air and positive images. If there are billboards at all, maybe we ought to have positive images. But we couldn't get up there because the tobacco companies have the monopoly. Welcome you to country fresh Salem. So we decided we were going to go to a different outlet, and we welcome people to the taste of country fresh arsenic. Now, this was the first paid counter advertisement in the United States. In 1977, a few colleagues and I in Miami, Florida, began to purchase billboard bus bench advertising. And we bought $3,000 worth of bus benches out of our own pocket, and we blitzed the city. For barely $25 a bus bench, you can be up there 24 hours a day, and there's nothing those drug pushers can say about it. That's where people are. That's the context of their community. Every single person in advertising, every single person in health care, the Mr. Fit people, all advise, oh, don't do that. Oh, that's so... And by the way, you might ruin our control group if it actually is effective. <laughs> We're talking about people in our own health community who as re are as reprehensible as the tobacco industry itself because they really don't care. They just want their study to work and they really don't want to get involved in the community apart from their own pro-band and their own cohorts. We're talking about what really works, where people are in the context of the data. And you can imagine, what's this, what's this new brand people were saying to themselves? We got irate calls when this ad came out. Well, where's the warning? You didn't put the warning. <laughs> now, we didn't do a double-blind control study, but there were many more skid marks in front of our bus benches than any other bus bench in town. <laughs> we got doctors to... to, to, to uh, to adopt a bus bench. And I would, I would urge the National Medical Association, I'd be happy to work with them. Maybe Doc will put up a couple of bucks for every one that a member of the NMA would put up to adopt a bus bench. And we take a look at how they're going at you with money. Save money by smoking. I can't figure that one out, but that's how they work. In Black History Month, a picture in that corner of George Washington Carver on an ad for Salem cigarettes. Makes you cry. It's truly astounding. And this is what Bayard Rustin had to say before he died about the tobacco industry. How do you feel about the uh, uh, cigarette companies trying to entice blacks into smoking? Well, I have a very, very clear position on it. With blacks suffering heart attacks uh, and with an incidence which is almost double that of white males, and with cancer being over 50%, it grieves me very much that cigarette companies would add to the frustration and economic and social problems which have already created these uh, high incidences of these diseases by further exacerbating the condition for blacks uh, by advertising inordinately in black magazines, radio stations, and the like. I am grieved by it. I was going to ask you whether this is bad or good or a fair or unfair, but I don't think... Well, I think it is not just good or bad. It is a profound tragedy that the cigarette companies would target a group that they already know 
is ready to receive and use cigarettes out of the anguish and despair of many, many years of mistreatment and the frustration which that has caused. There is something cynical about their doing this. Well, a great black leader having to say that, it, it, it's just truly amazing how we've really not listened and how we've rationalized this particular issue. Well, we don't always just sit back. We take a look at how they promote money, and we simply say, 10-year supply, only $7,000. Another way to get people to look at how much money they are wasting, it, over and over again, because advertising is not a matter of being clever. It's a matter of being repetitious. Arctic Lights, this was a ridiculous brand that came out about 10 years ago. It's silly, no brand comes in an ice cube, so we simply said, discover Arctic Lungs, guaranteed to make you cool as a corpse. <laughs> and we see these billboards up. These are always sponsored with the good word of the Outdoor Advertising Association, saying help fight teenage drug abuse. How, what are you supposed to do when you see an ad like that? You just walk down the street anyway and you see that. Same company. Well, we have an answer for that. Instead of saying 75 years and still smoking, we say 75 years and still cancerous. Just the way to laugh at it. And if kids were walking around with those kind of t-shirts instead of all the hot wax and the, all the junky gr rock groups in town, we might begin to get somewhere. I smoke for taste. This guy came out with a cigarette dangling out of his crotch saying, I smoke for taste. It's a dope. It's a moron. We've got to call him that. So we reposed him with a cigarette dangling out of a different orifice saying, I smoke for smell. <laughs> and that's the kind of imagery we've got to promote. Or this guy who looks really uptight, golden lights, you really know you're smoking. He's so uptight, he doesn't want to show us his mouth. We've got a much more relaxed guy who says, yellow lights, they'll really know you're smoking. <laughs> Ridiculing the cosmetic aspect of it all and taking a look at where we are. She's daring you to smoke, daring you to smoke. Well, we have an ad that this kid made up called Mora. And that's the way we do. We get the kids ridiculing, not smoking and not the diseases, but we ridicule those brand names and the companies. Benson and Hedges becomes in our lingo, Benson and Heart Attack. We take the bus benches out where kids are. We get them laughing along with it. Virginia Slims, this lady is the epitome of elegance, or maybe this lady is one of our ladies in Super Health 2000, our promotion. But what are we gonna do when Virginia Slims comes to town for the cigarette promotion? We take out bus benches that say emphysema Slims. You've coughed up long enough, baby. <laughs> and when they go after kids like that one, a 12-year-old ball boy, we bring in Martina No Smokanova, who throws out cigarette butts and gets a good laugh at their expense. We're gonna have an all-night vigil for victims of Virginia Slims uh, around the country at these various events or we call it Virginia Slime. And those ads were done by kids. And just to conclude, I just wanted to play one little tidbit of that bright young guy under the fuel tank lighting up uh, for America's Best. And I could joke about him because he's not a moron at all. He's a very caring, feeling guy by the name of David Gerlitz. And David Gerlitz visited his brother barely a year ago in a cancer ward in a hospital in Massachusetts and started asking around all the nurses and doctors, my God, there's so many young people here. How come? And they matter-of-factly, as they were going on their rounds, said, oh, well, you know, smoking. Even they were inured to the fact that they couldn't do anything about it, so they said, smoking, what else? We're talking about people who are not old. They just look old, dying in their hospital beds. I've heard people say, yeah, I knew it could, could kill me or could hurt me, on, uh, but I thought that was at the other end of my life, not this end. That's the tragedy. We're talking about what David, David Gerlitz said, when he started doing commercials for us, thanks to Tony Schwartz, an um, advertiser in New York, and he then made some statements about what it was like to be on the shoots with them. It was one of our first or second shoots that we were on, and uh, we were all sitting around at the end of the day, and I was joking around, and I had asked a question of the account executives of the ad agency and the client who was there visiting, making sure everything was going right. I said, see, how come none of you guys smoke? And one of the guys from the tobacco company said uh, he laughed and basically the truth of the matter was he said we don't smoke that shit and uh, he said we reserve that right for the young the poor the blacks and the stupid oh. I asked him I said there's no blacks you know here on the shoot with us and he said there never will be uh, we have a target market where we go for in the ghettos and the other areas where they live that we give them their own campaign where we put them in the same situation but we just use black models I said you mean you don't use black models in the regular never he said never mm -hmm. Well, we've got it from the horse's mouth. We know what they're up to. 
And when the American Cancer Society had this marvelous brochure out a few years ago, I asked for quite a few thousand copies. I wanted to distribute this. And I said, this is marvelous. This tells it like it is, smoking and genocide. And what was the response? The Cancer Society, oh, gee, we, 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 they're being reprinted now. I said, what well, reprinted? What was the matter with it? Well, you know, we've had to edit a little bit to take out words like genocide, because it might offend people. Doggone it, we've got to offend people in this issue. And the people we want to offend most are the parasites, the SOBs in the tobacco industry and any ally of them. Any researcher who takes money from the tobacco industry, any medical school who takes money from the tobacco industry, anyone, really ought to know better. And I think our aim is to take a look and laugh. We see a couple like that in a cigarette ad. Maybe the answer is not words. Maybe the answer is silence. Maybe the answer is something like that. Up on billboards, in communities everywhere, not saying a word. So what, what's that all about? I don't know. I don't know. The name of our program is Super Health 79. We've since changed it to Super Health 2000 to give ourselves a little bit more time. <laughs> and uh, what we can do is I've got a videotape after which, since I've gone over time, I can play, which talks about what we are doing in an inner city in California, and unfortunately what the tobacco industry is doing as well. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity I've spoken. Just want to say that what we're trying to do is to leap tall buildings at a single bound. The buildings on Madison Avenue that uh, rip off kids. And what we're trying to do is to get them to be faster than a speeding bullet and more powerful than a locomotive in setting what we call a, uh, a Super Health uh, 2000 example for their communities. And Dr. Jones, I just wanted to thank you very, very much again. And I'm going to present you with some posters and t-shirts and a bumper sticker that says, is your child hooked yet? And the National Center for Health Statistics shows that a greater percentage of blacks smoke than any other group of Americans. Critics say that's no coincidence because tobacco companies spend millions of dollars trying to get blacks to smoke. My brother did it. You know, I, I thought he was cool and I wanted to be cool, so I, I smoked cigarettes. I am afraid of it, but I'm so addicted that it's hard to stop. For American blacks, not smoking isn't just a matter of choice these days. It's a question of life and death. I think it's a serious, much, much more serious problem than most of the black people realize. Uh, early, you know, unless you're in a field like I am, where we sign death certificates, uh, uh, we don't really know how many people are dying. And While black physicians view the smoking issue with growing alarm, critics charge that the tobacco companies view black smokers as a growing source of income. In fact, they say, blacks are the target of carefully plotted and highly specific marketing campaigns. They're particularly honing in on people with the lowest disposable income who are taught that smoking is something that is glamorous and wealthy. And the important thing, too, is there are many streets in black areas where virtually all of the retail outlets have cigarette advertising. It's an enormous, heavy concentration. Critics also point out that in many low-income areas, more than half of the billboards carry tobacco ads. Offers of free cigarettes and cheaper generic brands are an added twist. Mass transit systems used by lower-income commuters are another popular showcase for black-oriented ads. The tobacco industry denies vehemently that they target black groups or any other group. It just isn't true. We advertise nationally to everybody. But the charges made that these days the industry goes beyond buying advertising to buying influence. At entertainment, cultural, and sports events across the country, good times mingle with the cigarette message in the form of banners, hats, and free samples. Hey, enjoy the sales and enjoy the sales. And that's not all. The cigarette companies are very fond of portraying themselves as the leading corporate benefactors to such organizations as the United Negro College Fund or the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Our concern with the black community goes, predates any question of the uh, issue of smoking in health or attempt to use it. And to say that this is something new is crazy. We fund a wide range of organizations, from the Boy Scouts to the YMCA's to art museums to hospitals. But the critics maintain that because black groups are so dependent on tobacco company funding, black publications and leaders tend not to speak out about smoking's impact on their community. Again, the industry cries foul. You get zealots, I will even call them nuts, who engage in a kind of McCarthyism based on statistics 
which are unreliable, which are contradictory. They know it's going to kill these people, and they're willing to uh, peddle cigarettes in any way that will be successful for them to get richer. So the controversy continues, but down in Durham, North Carolina, in the heart of tobacco country, the nation's largest black insurance company is taking action. They've started a stop smoking project sponsored by the National Cancer Institute. About 40% of the black people are less informed, are depressed economically and socially, and I think more of them are smoking. The goal is to help people like Mary Ann Johnson, who finally quit a lifelong habit four weeks ago. I just decided to change a lot of things in my life that I was doing that I uh, could correct at this point to live a little longer, hopefully. Unfortunately, it's a little late for George Nunn, who smoked three packs a day for 62 years. Cigarette made you cough so bad. Every time I, 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 I couldn't hold a cigarette in my mouth, I'd have to take a draw and take it out. I cough so bad. <laughs> he has lung cancer and emphysema. On a more hopeful note, against heavy ads and big budgets, some black education does seem to be working. This teenage rap group composed an anti-smoking song for a school assembly. Smoking cigarettes, but you just catch a camper, got lungs like a tire. These youngsters sum up the message that groups like North Carolina Mutual hope will offset the powerful voice of the tobacco industry. They think they're cool by smoking, right? But as you smoke, you know, your lungs and all this gets weaker and weaker, and soon they'll be laying up in the hospital somewhere. And, well, you can't be cool in the hospital. The tobacco industry continues to believe that the results of scientific investigations to date demonstrate no cause and effect relationship between smoking and chronic diseases. Nonetheless, later this month, Congressman Waxman's open, or committee will open hearings on a proposal to ban all cigarette advertising. Hang outside many schools and you'll see young people smoking. Everyone knows cigarettes aren't good for you, so why do they smoke? The kids at Nystrom Elementary School in Richmond checked it out and then started a campaign to sell people on not smoking. The number one killer drug is tobacco. This is a picture of a man with a motorcycle. Our art class is trying to uglify cigarettes, but the company is trying to glamorize. It says cool because the company wants you to think that when you grow up it will be cool to smoke. We make the we make the marble old man into the marble old man. And, and we make it come to where the flavor is, come to where the cancer is. As you can see, he is throwing up. And he came to where the cancer is. You might think that all the ads that make smoking seem cool or sexy are aimed at adults. But the fact is, companies try to get kids interested in smoking as well. Ever buy a pack of candy cigarettes? They shouldn't make cigarettes like these because when children are little, they'll smoke them. And as they grow older, they'll start thinking it's cool and fancy and glamorous. They're trying to make the little kids smoke the cigarettes so I can have camper like the big kids. It's pretty easy to block out thinking about the dangers down the road till you see firsthand what smoking really does to the body. The normal lungs is our lungs that we breathe. The second one is from when people start to smoke and they start breathing more fast, faster. And on the third one is cancer, when they, have to, when they have smoked too much and they start to breathe faster. And then after a while, they die. Does anybody have a, a relative Me. that takes a, walks upstairs or does picks Me. up something Me. and afterwards Me. is out of breath? My mama like that. She said she got emphysema. That's what she said. And when she walk up the stairs or she might um, do something around the house for just a minute or something, she'd be breathing hard, always tired and stuff like that. And she been smoking for a long time, too. So who do you get angry at? I get angry at the companies, and I, I get, sometimes I get angry at her for smoking. But I know she can't help it sometimes. The people who's making the cigarettes, they don't care about you. All they care about is the money that they want. They don't care about your body and your health and that you can die. They just want the money and make more and just keep on getting money. What about the kids in Doug are? Minkler's class put their imaginations to work to combat all the okay, posters and billboards making smoking look fresh. 
they created a poster series to do the opposite. We're going to make some slides out of these. We're going to send them to this association called Doctors Out of Care so that they can uh, and hope that uh, they send them, send them to different places so that people will see what um, cigarettes really do to you. These posters have beautiful color and design, don't, don't but the stop. images of the Barfboro Man and Virginia Slime are enough to make anyone think twice about putting smoke in their lungs. They're working on sending the poster exhibit on a national tour sponsored by doctors, and they hope to turn some of the pictures into full-size billboards. But the posters aren't the only way they're getting their message across. Well, I'm at the, I don't just need Cigarettes are bad for you and me. It's bad for your lungs and bad for your health. At the end, oh, uh, let me tell you something else. Smoking is so bad, it can cause you death. I know this man, he's in Barthorough land. But all they sell is drugs. They don't care about your life, they just want your money. Well, I'm the deaf, I'm all by myself. You shouldn't puff a cigarette because it's bad for you. You might be a good singer or a good dancer, but you smoke a new porch could cause you can't. Richmond kids spreading the word and not the smoke. The police don't smoke and live a long life without cancer.